Welcome back everyone. Today um, we're gonna be trying to tackle a question that I also get a lot, which is where do you start and how do you get work? As with any non-corporate profession out there, there isn't really an answer to this question, at least not a clear-cut answer. However, if you observe the careers of, you know, composers that came before you, you might start to see certain patterns. And so I want to go over those patterns. So as for pattern one, um, you very often will see film composers who have had a career in um, as a performing artist or um, who were concert composers first before they were film composers. They usually switched over, you know, later in life once they already had an established career and very often if you look at their stories, it kind of happened by accident. Recent examples would include, uh, you know, Junkie XL or Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, um, Daft Punk. Um, those would be people from, you know, the popular music scene or electronic music scene coming over into film scoring. You currently have a lot of Icelandic concert composers or also electronic artists that um, you know, filmmakers pick and that are starting to work in film scoring as well. And then you have people like you know, Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmer, uh, Philip Glass, um, even John Williams. He started out as a you know, session pianist. He was a jazz pianist initially and um, you know, an arranger, an orchestrator. And then eventually, you know, after many, many years of doing that, he, you know, was kind of, you know, starting to write and help out until he was finally hired as the lead composer. So even he started out as a, an actual musician instead of straight up a, you know, film composer. Then in the, I think, 50s and 60s in particular, you know, there was a high demand for rock and roll artists. Before that, in the golden age, the first golden age of Hollywood, where you have the old studio system, um, you know, in the 30s, around that time, um, you had a lot of classical composers actually in working in film music. I mean, more recent examples, not from that time, would be Bernard Herrmann or Ennio Morricone. But um, during that time, you had Max Steiner and, you know, a lot of people that, yeah, that really came out of the classical world and, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, very often they were, you know, kind of shunned by the classical world for still doing, you know, the romanticism that was just passé in classical music at the time, but that was very welcomed by Hollywood. That's why you have all these super romantic, um, almost operatic or symphonic scores in uh, movies from the 30s and 40s. Some composers ended up, like classical composers ended up doing um, film music for the commercial value because there was apparently more money to be made from film music than there was from classical concert music. But yeah, very often uh, those early classical composers were, you know, kind of just rejected by <laughs> the classical music community and were then welcomed by Hollywood. Um, you know, it, it was kind of a look down upon profession at the time. Uh, it wasn't always as popular as it is now. Um, so, you know, the image of the job definitely shifted, but uh, at the time it was kind of, you know, the people who were doing film music were the ones that could make it in the concert world, basically. So there's a large percentage of current and former film composers all throughout the decades that basically came out of the concert world or, you know, out of the, you know, performing artist world. Um, and then kind of made their accidental transition into film scoring. It is one way to go. I mean, um, these people did not necessarily start out thinking, oh, I'm going to be a film composer. They just wanted to make music. Um, and then they kind of made a name for themselves internationally. And then filmmakers kind of took notice and were like, hey, you know what? That thing um, would be great for my movie. So let's contact this person and see if they want to write music for my movie. So they were specifically wanted for their unique voice in that moment. Um, and a lot of these artists crossing over for the first time, I think Danny Elfman has spoken about this on plenty of occasions, but plenty of other composers as well, um, how they really needed quite a bit of help when they started crossing over. Because 
film music is very different from, um, you know, just writing music without picture. And especially, you know, in previous times when you had to deal with tape and everything and, you know, film tape, but also recording tape and all this analog stuff, it, it was a bit more difficult, I would think, to get into it. Um, so they're usually paired up, you know, with experienced orchestrators and arrangers and music editors so that, you know, they can kind of smoothly transition over. Um, they can still do their artistry and do their style and write their music, but then have a team around them that also knows the specifics of film scoring. Then you have pattern two, which is composers that do set out to be film composers right from the start, which is really more of a recent development because the profession has gained so much um, popularity over the past, I'd say, 20, 25 years. The profession, as I said, was not, <laughs> was not as desired, you know, a good 30 years or more ago. But those newer composers may or may not go to college for it. I mean, there are plenty of college programs now. That wasn't really the case in the past. A lot of these programs are fairly new, save for, you know, very few. And then very often they will move to, you know, one of the bigger media hubs in the world to, you know, make connections and, you know, start to work on films. Um, usually, you know, by meeting a lot of people and really hustling. So they will really go where the opportunities lie and then just try and meet up with directors and showrunners and producers and game developers and, you know, anybody who creates anything. Um, this is a very, very, um, I mean, not that the first approach is easy, but this one's also very difficult because um, you have to do so much of this. You have to send out so many reels, write so many cold emails, make so many phone calls, go to so many events and just hustle every day to get that next job. So this approach really requires a lot of groundwork, a lot of attending screenings and festivals and conventions and whatnot, anything you, that you can think of. Um, so it, it can be very stressful. It's probably a, a bit better if you're an extrovert in those situations. If you're an introvert, you're just gonna have to deal with it, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is definitely, you have to put yourself out there a lot, every single day. Use social media, use, you know, probably YouTube, any platform that you can think of to market yourself, you're going to have to do that. Because in any case, you're probably going to be, you know, doing a hundred cold emails for, you know, maybe one gig that you're going to get. And that's not going to change. Um, that's also not going to change once you have credits or anything. So in this approach, uh, composers would first probably dabble a lot in short films, probably connect with film schools and try and get connections with film students and, you know, kind of just get those credits in. And then they would go probably further into the indie world, you know, first the ultra low budget indie world to get those first features under their belt maybe um, get on some indie games that, you know, are currently on a Kickstarter uh, campaign and don't have a composer yet, you know, anything like that. Anything to just get a portfolio and to get those first connections, those first steps in the profession. And then, you know, eventually the goal would be that, um, you know, you meet people in these productions and then eventually they would take you up as they move up, you know, next time they have a bigger game or next time, you know, maybe they have a proper studio backing their production, you know, stuff like that. And then they would bring you on and then you would get to work on bigger productions with them. Um, you're kind of tying your career to their career in a way. So it's probably wise to have a lot of these connections because a lot of them are also not going to pan out. Also be aware that something that does happen is that a lot of directors will get a shot, for example, by a studio, and they will get to direct something bigger, but then the studio will insist on surrounding them with more experienced people. So also these directors might not always be able to bring you on to their big productions if the studio then requires no actually you're inexperienced, so we want you surrounded with the team of experienced people. Which doesn't mean they're never gonna hire you again, but it might just be that when they get the big break doesn't necessarily mean you get your big break. 
Um, even if we look at those director-composer combinations that we all admire, that have worked so well over the past, um, a lot of the time the director will be younger than the composer. So the composer will be the more experienced entity on that team. But yeah, there are plenty of good examples of, you know, various team members elevating a composer's career because they've worked together for a while and, you know, they're going on to do bigger stuff and they're just kind of taking the composer with them, which is great. Just also be aware that obviously, you know, the director or producer have no obligation to continue hiring you. Um, you know, sometimes you have a falling out or sometimes, you know, you have creative differences and you just don't want to work with each other anymore or they want to try new stuff. So, um, you know, at any given moment, you know, they are the people in power. And so they kind of, you know, can decide whether they bring you on or not. So um, just be aware of that. As I said, it can be very risky because you're kind of placing your own career development and your own advancement into the hands of someone else, assuming that they're going to take you with them all the way. There's an inherent lack of, of control in, in, this, um, in this approach. But then again, you know, it's a numbers game. Um, the more people you work with, the higher your chance of, um, you know, one of them eventually helping you out when you need it. Other composers that have taken this approach have also given the opposite opinion. So I just want to be aware of that. Um, so they've basically said it's much better to take a day job and kind of make your money with that day job. And then you don't have to take every gig that comes your way. So you can just kind of pick and choose the you know golden nuggets or the things that you find the most promising or that you find creatively enticing. And then your day job is paying the bills pretty much. So there are plenty of uh, composers, successful composers that have done that too. So this is a legit approach. I really believe the quality versus quantity um, question has been going on since, you know, it's a debate that's been going on since before I was born. So both ways work and, you know, who's to say what's right. And then you have approach number three, um, which is kind of a more of an approach, I would say, that um, found its roots in the early 2000s up to now. Um, which is you kind of start out like in approach number two, where you, you know, set out to be a film composer and you go to college or not, and you move to a bigger media city. And then um, in this case, you don't bet on your fellow filmmakers, you bet on your fellow composer. So you become a composer's assistant and kind of hope that, you know, after spending some time in the trenches and getting credits and kind of serving that person or multiple people for a specific amount of time that eventually they're going to help you out or other people on the team are going to help you out. So with the assistant route, you really start at the very bottom down in the trenches as an intern or junior assistant. And then you're slowly working your way up either as an employee full time on a monthly salary or as a contractor. And then you work your way into ideally a, a writing position and then after you've done that for a while, hopefully, you know, in an ideal situation, the composer would, you know, offer you a co-write or, you know, kind of a producer writer situation where, you know, your name kind of gets put somewhere in the front as well and where they can kind of push your career a little bit and kind of put in a good word for you with the right people and then kind of set you off on your journey. The advantage of this approach is, of course, you get a ton of credits. You get a ton of experience you otherwise wouldn't be getting, especially when it comes to bigger productions, the whole team infrastructure, the whole music department structure, how many people are involved, who does what, workflow, uh, live sessions, which otherwise at the beginning of your career you would not have access to, of course. Um, you're learning so much. Um, you have access to gear that normally you wouldn't have access to at the beginning of your career. You get a ton of connections, um, you know, inside the composer's team, but also if you're at a studio where there are multiple composers, you know, you get those connections, you get um, connections at scoring stages and, you know, with agents and you go to events and all this kind of stuff. You just kind of 
in the mix of people that you want to know. Um, and of course, if you're doing a good job, you're also getting a lot of endorsements from all sides. So um, that's really helpful later along the way. The disadvantage is that while you're getting monthly pay, which is nice, the pay is usually really low. It's barely survivable, if, if that, with a few exceptions. Some composers take really good care of their teams, but I, I would not make that my expectation, if you know what I mean. The hours are pretty grueling, of course. Not that that's different later, but there are hours worked for someone else, and um, it kind of feels different. Uh, it's not like now that I'm my own business owner um, that I work less, but it feels like a different kind of work, if that makes sense. Um, being an employee and putting in those 16-hour days and, you know, sometimes working seven days a week and it's crunch time and you're sleeping at the studio and just, you know, you're just really in the trenches, it can be incredibly draining and... If you're working for a busy composer, sometimes that means you have very little private life. And of course you spent years working for someone else's brand. That's something that you have to understand. Even though you're getting all those music department credits that you can take with you later on, um, you are working to make someone else more successful. Um, and you're working to make them look good. So while you will have your moments to shine, you are working on someone else's brand and someone else's company on their career and not your own career. So there's a certain balance that needs to be maintained. Because while you're doing that, you're not fostering your own relationships. For every minute, every hour, every day that you spend at someone else's studio, you are not working on your own career, of course. You're not making your own connections. Um, and that can sometimes get people stuck in the assistant uh, position. If they do it for too long and they're kind of known as someone's assistant, uh, it's kind of very hard to get out of that and um, to go out there on your own and kind of be seen as your own entity, as your own composer. Because at the end of the day, it's not your name on the music. You always have to understand that. It's someone else's name. Even if you're an additional writer or a ghost writer or whatever you did, um, it will be the, the top billing credit will go to another person. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily advancing your career. So there will come a point in this third approach where the learning and the experience and all, that, all the good stuff will no longer outweigh the bad stuff, where you're not really getting enough out of it anymore to justify not building your own career. And that's kind of the point where you have to realize, okay, I'm going to have to kind of get an exit strategy in place and kind of communicate that and, and really, um, you know, start building my own brand. Because if I stay here longer, you know, I'm not going to get that much more out of the job but instead I'm just going to be stuck here and I I'm, I'm missed the moment to leave and do the thing on my own. Also, of course, you have no guarantee that the composer is going to help you out in the end. There are some that do that and there are others that absolutely do not do that. Sometimes that's communicated up front, sometimes it isn't. So sometimes you're betting on um, something to happen that was never going to happen. Um, so keep that in mind too. This is no guarantee. Assisting is no guarantee that the composer is eventually going to elevate your career in any way. Because that's not their job. It's the nice thing to do, <laughs> um, especially if they've enjoyed that benefit. Um, but not all of them will. So, um, you know, some of them will just let you go and not do anything for you. And that's also going to be a reality that you're going to have to deal with possibly. And then there's also something that um, should be kept in mind. Um, you can accumulate a lot of music department credits, but really what a lot of hiring entities, as in filmmakers and executives want to see, are really composer credits. So your additional writing credits can be really helpful, but at the end of the day, it does not weigh as much as having composer credits. So um, I know quite a few people who are having huge trouble building up their composer career because they have 150 music department credits, 
but only three composer credits. And there's not really a way for them to, you know, shift that um, that dynamic because now they're just seen as a music department member and not as a team leader, as the head of the music department, because then they would have the composer credit. So also keep that in mind. Too many music department credits can be a negative sometimes. So what's the conclusion? I would think those are the three approaches that I see the most. I would say if I had to give advice, um, probably the best way to go is to diversify and diversify with focus. Meaning, um, you know, I was an assistant for some time, but also I never stopped making my own relationships and I never stopped, you know, doing my own movies on the side. So I was doing both. I was doing the assistant thing. I was doing pattern two and three at the same time, um, just to maximize my chances, you know, just in case um, one of the two wasn't going to work out. Um, so, you know, diversify as much as you can, but with, with focus. So um, have your goal in mind and really see, okay, what different ways can I approach this to get to that goal? Um, so I would not necessarily advise people to just do anything or to just, you know, um, do anything music related because not everything music related is going towards that goal. Um, if that's really, if earning a living full time as a film composer is your goal, then, um, you know, whatever you do, always do it with the intention of this should have some kind of meaning um, or some kind of um, momentum towards that. Um, at least that's how I did it. That's how I um, became a full-time composer and transitioned out of, you know, the assistant thing and all that. Um, by just basically every tiny effort that I would make would always be, well, if I do this, maybe it's going to lead to that, and maybe that's going to lead to that, and maybe that's going to lead to that, you know? It was always kind of throwing various pebbles into into a lake and just kind of seeing which ones would, you know, would lead to the destination. I guess, you know, the more irons you have in the fire, the better. So I would not even just say, you know, focus on one approach. Just focus on as many as you can. Because one of them might just work out, and you never know which one it's going to be.